What's up, everybody? I'm Madison Brodsky at the opening night of AFI Fest. We are celebrating the world premiere of Tick, Tick, Boom, which will be on Netflix later this month. We talked to the entire cast, including Mr. Director Lin-Manuel Miranda, who convinced Andrew Garfield to sing in this movie. Find out how right now. How important was it to get Jonathan's work and collection right in this film? Well, you know, I, I'm here because Jonathan Larson wrote Rent. I saw Rent on my 17th birthday. I saw a Tick, Tick, Boom when I was 21 years old and questioning whether I could really do this for a living. And at every step of the way, Jonathan's work was very clarifying and like a call to action to me. And so I hope it functions that way for, for other artists because that's, that's his work's effect on me. Out of all the amazing works that you've already put out and stuff that you're keeping secret and holding for later dates, why was this the perfect project for you to make your directorial debut? Um, I just, I felt like I understood it. I, I, I have been a struggling songwriter in my 20s. I have done the jobs you have to do so that you can do the work you love. And I just understood that on a bone deep level. And, um, and, and you know, on top of that, my respect for Jonathan and my love for his music, I just felt like if they only let me make one, uh, I'm really grateful it's this one. Hi, Andrew. So nice to meet you. What did it take to get Lynn to convince you to finally debut your amazing singing voice? Oh, that's very kind. He, all he had to do was like, just like raise an eyebrow in my direction. I would have been there in a flash because he's he's an artistic genius and a hero of mine. So to be in in, in a space with him collaborating and an incredible collaborator and generous and inspiring and generative and passionate and joyful and fun and silly and he acts like a seven-year-old boy all the time, and it's like, who doesn't want to be around that? And then you get to honor this incredible character. You get to honor Jonathan Larson, which I, I, we, we, we all tried to do. But the, the, the first time I encountered Jonathan was freshman in high school. I think the month or two in, I was discovering the musical theater group, which you know, is like, that's, that's a niche market right there. This is a very particular group. And someone said, have you listened to Rent? I said, I knew Seasons of Love, and that was it. And they showed me the album, and I looked at the cover, and I saw black faces. I saw brown faces, I saw white faces coexisting. I had never seen that before in my life. Shook me, shook me. And then I listened to the music and I was like, well, this is different. I was, I was like the kid, you know, I wasn't, a, there were certain rules in the hood where you were like, I don't want to tell people out loud that I listen to rock. It was all hip hop. So when I first listened to it, I was kind of like resistant, like, what is this rent? And then it got to like, without you and one song, Glory. And I was like, ooh, wash over me, you know? It's beautiful. I mean, Jonathan didn't really get his roses while he was still alive because his best and greatest work wasn't out to the public yet. So why do you think this is the perfect time for him to finally get that honor and to honor his legacy? Well, here's the thing. We're just coming out of a pandemic. We're coming out of a period where we face mortality every single day, like it or not. When we talk about tick, tick, boom, you're talking about the crack epidemic. You're talking about the AIDS epidemic. We're talking about so many ancestors who left us. So many black and brown queer folks who didn't get to have elders, who were just a race. We have lots of queer white stories that get told, but the women were left out, and the black and brown folks were left out. And you know, now with Jonathan, with this, is we get a chance to look back on that period. And that's, that's, that's really dope, really cool, but really important. And rewriting. Did you crack it yet? Oh, I'm getting so close. And rewriting. Can I hear it? Any day now. Eight years! And the time keeps ticking. Tick, tick. You need to ask, are you letting yourself be led by fear or by love? Fear! A hundred percent fear! So why do you think that this is the perfect year to honor his legacy? It is the perfect year to honor Jonathan Larson's legacy. This movie has been waiting in the wings for a long time. I just said to somebody, and I think it's really true, it's like this bottle with this note has been floating out on the ocean, and tonight it's finally come to shore. He was so ahead of his time. When you take a, a, an opera like La Boheme and you turn it and modernize it into Rent, and it takes the world by storm, and you don't get to see that. You don't get to live in that, the, the joy of that. There's something um, sad about that and poignant about that. However, the message in the bottle that he's given us is so exciting and so magical. And it's almost a time capsule. And it's like, how are we gonna live? Who are we gonna be? 
How are we going to care for our friends during a pandemic? Because it was the AIDS pandemic back then, and now it's the COVID pandemic that we're living with. There was something about that soul, his soul, that came back through Lynn manuel Miranda, through uh, Brian Grazer and uh, Ron Howard and Julie O, because Lynn and Julie were talking about this for a long time. They brought that back, and thankfully, AFI is here tonight and Netflix, and we have this opportunity to see the, the time from the bottle. Tell me a little bit about the time that you found out about Jonathan's work and what it meant to you. I found about Jonathan Larson through Rent when I was younger. I had to have been about like 10 or 12 when I saw the film. And honestly, it blew me away. I have loved musical theater since I was a kid, but I'd never seen something so dope, like a rock opera, you know, type of vibe that went with his music and his writing. I was blown away by that. And I also love the picture that he painted of friendship and community and struggling artists who love what they do. I mean, as a kid, I was like, yep, I want to do that. So tell us a little bit about how Roger fits into the storyline. So Roger Bart um, was one of his friends, Jonathan Larson's friends, who they grew up together. They, they went to Summerstock together. And, and in this film and, and, and in real life, he supported Jonathan's dream so much. He knew that he was a genius. So he was one of those people that was always trying to push him and say, keep going. He always encouraged him. And so that's my, that's my contribution to this. Anytime you see me looking at him, I'm just like, you got what it takes keep going. So many people have done that for me and I get to be here today. So get all in. So um, yeah, that's that's my role in this. I love that. I think that it's really interesting because of course the whole messaging of the storyline is about a struggling artist continuing and continuing and continuing until they finally make their dreams come true. Can you relate to that storyline in any way? I can. I can. You know, in, in this film, his dreams do come true, but it's not in a way that he really expects that it will. And a dream coming true, sometimes other things, you lose people along the way. You lose relationships, you miss a funeral, you miss a wedding. Um, and yes, I, I can because I remember coming up when I got to New York in 2006, you know, I was, I, there were readings that would come up, there were workshops, and I was like, I'm going to do that because I think it's going to be a stepping stone to take me to the next level. But I would miss, uh, you know, a best friend's birthday or a cousin's wedding. And, and success and a dream coming true is a complicated thing because it's not, everything is just not perfect. And so that's something that I learned early. And, you know, you hope that you're surrounded by people um, who understand what you're really trying to do um, and what your dream is. Uh, I'm blessed to have that with an incredible family and friends. and. Um, and Jonathan had those friends as well. I don't know what the show is. Why do we play with fire? What if the workshop happens and nothing changes? What then, Jonathan? Maybe I'm just wasting my time. Do you know how many Jonathan Larsons there are? One. Why should we blaze a train? There's not enough time. I went to three friends' funerals last year, and nobody is doing enough. I'm not doing enough. Try writing about what you know. Hi, I'm Lin-Manuel Miranda, and you've just been buzzed.